Or you don't, let me know, I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, I have a short introduction and what I wanted to do was actually to unfold a little bit the playful research project that we did when we started exploring shared living and sort of the importance of, of community and communal living. And there's nothing new in communal living. We've been doing it since the beginning of humanity. And I think it really speaks to the fact that we are indeed social beings and we thrive best together. Not always, depending on the differences, but in general, what we aim or what we long for as humans are human connections. And we have lost a lot of that in this modern age and in the way that we have since urbanization, since the industrial age has have designed our cities in ways that have actually removed us a, a lot from where we came from back in the days where we lived in smaller villages or even further back when we lived in tribes. So there's nothing new under the sun, but I think the approach to how we live communal and what we dream of when it comes to living in communal settings or in communities have probably changed and we wanted to explore that. And what better way to do that to, than to invite the people in and ask the people. Uh, so we did this survey. Oh, yeah, before we start the survey, I forgot my joke. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so I think this is uh, like we have, you know, as I also mentioned earlier, we've never been more people on the planet. We've never actually lived closer. Uh, but even though we live a lot closer, it doesn't necessarily mean that we are having a better time with each other. And uh, this is an extreme uh, case from a swimming pool in, uh, in, in Japan. Um, it's actually a, a real picture, but, um, but I think it just you know, gives sort of an exaggerated example of the fact that we are living extremely close, especially in a lot of countries that are not here in Europe. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we feel closer connected. Actually, there's a global epi uh, epidemic of loneliness and social isolation, and it leads to a lot of, uh, of a lot of the challenges for people who, who suffers from this. So as I also mentioned, we have been looking into this for two years, and what we kick-started with was, was actually this survey called one Shared House 2030. You can still go to the website. It is a playful research project where we explore what would people actually be willing to share. And I'm just going to show you a little intro video. Oh no, I am not. I will try again. Will it show the video? No? Oh, we did not check that technical mistake. So there is no link to this video. Go to One Shared House uh, 2030 and you will see the video as an introduction. Um, but anyway, so what we did was to make it look really nice and be very playful in the way you interact with it. It's a questionnaire that asks people what would they be willing to share within different uh, sort of areas of, of shared living and just to give you a few examples of, of what that could be it could be a question like who owns your community members share equal ownership members pay rent to management members share different levels of ownership or some members own others rent and then people and you guys will have to answer those questions and we do that through multiple different sort of aspects of communal li living. There's also another interesting where we ask what are pe people willing to share. People are willing to share almost everything. The least popular was though sharing toilets. Um, and uh, finally, you ask what are some of the most important qualities in your co-housing members? Cleanliness, that they're handy, that they're honest, that they're interesting, intelligent, funny. There's a lot of answers. So we basically really try to look both at super practical um, questions, but also more emotional and psychological questions. It is, as I mentioned earlier, it became a very successful survey. It was shared by 
all big medias in the world and we have 115,000 visitors on the website but actually 17,000 people have answered the entire questionnaire which has made it the biggest quantitative study of shared living in the world today. Here are some of the like in general globally from 133 countries the most popular answers to some of the questions. So people would actually prefer to live with four to ten people and that actually makes a lot of sense in regards to how we used to live in tribes and how we feel that we can still stay intimate. The next up is between ten and up to max a hundred. After a hundred nobody actually considers that a communal living situation anymore. So also when we see someone like we live, we work and other big co-living experiments out there right now they're designed a lot for hundreds of people. So how do you create community in buildings that needs to serve hundreds of people when actually community stems from much smaller groups of people together? So that also is a challenge for architecture or architects, I think. Most people would prefer to split energy bills based by the amount used per person. They pre prefer to live in the city, not in the countryside. They would prefer to live with a different mix of people, so not just similar to themselves. So we actually would like to be curious on other people's preferences and, and personalities and think that that can be an asset. Uh, the, the, the rates, the biggest con of co-living as the lack of privacy. So again, for architects, how can we find this balance between designing for privacy and shared living at the same time? Uh, rates the biggest pro of co-living as the opportunity to socialize. So again, the importance of creating and designing for social interaction. And uh, we would be actually more than happy to pay more money for extra service layers that makes our life more convenient. Uh, makes sense as well if we look at the trends in the world today. And uh, most people would prefer common and private spaces to have clear boundaries and they would actually like to share ownership of the co-living community. So these were also some of the answers that were feeding us with information before we sat down and designed uh, urban villages for the effect architects. And uh, just to show you that a lot of media took this up and, and this is again a way for us to use playful research as an enabler to start conversations and to get people engaged and to get input for the people that we actually want to design for. And uh, I'm going to end on that note and just say and remind you that there, in my opinion, is no innovation without a great story. Because if we don't create a great story, we do not emotionally connect. If we don't emotionally connect, we will not change. So that's it. Thank you.